evening. Very good. And welcome to all of you EIU students. We have some faculty here. I've seen an administrator. That rarely happens. Um, welcome to a um, yet another evening of entertainment for you. My name is Dr. Marco Grunhagen, and I'm your host for the evening. As the uh, Lumpkin Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship here at EIU, I'm also the director of our new Entrepreneurship Center. The Entrepreneurship Center has been officially named the SEED Center, which stands for Sustainable Entrepreneurship Through Education and Development. In short, we're trying to plant the seed to grow entrepreneurship in the region. Tonight's event is held during Entrepreneurship Week, a week of celebration of the entrepreneurial spirit here at EIU, which we have held for five years now. And we're very proud to host three Hallmark events this week. These events allow us to showcase the expertise and the contributions that the study of entrepreneurial ventures contributes to the local, the national, and even the global economy. This is also the fifth year in which we're offering our minor in entrepreneurship, a campus-wide minor housed in the School of Business, and we're very encouraged by almost 100 students from across the EIU campus that have chosen entrepreneurship as their minor concentration. And we have a number of entrepreneurship <coughs> minors here with us tonight. Would you guys raise your hand? <coughs> okay, very good. As you may know, apart from tonight's event, we were hosting two other speakers this week. On Monday evening, we listened to Alexis Teichmiller, one of our current students and founder of AT Avenue, a traveling fashion boutique. And last night, Mr. Bill Skeens, president and owner of Prairie City Bakery in Chicago, talked about, about lessons learned on his career path from corporate America to independent business owner. Our speaker tonight is one of our own as well. He graduated from the School of Business in 2002, and he has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his talk. So as I mentioned before, please feel free to use the note cards that we have passed around. There's more, more note cards um, over here and over on the other side. As you write down your questions, when you're done, pass them to the outside aisle, and the students will come along and collect those questions and then pass them to me. And so at the end of the talk, we will then get to asking Aaron a number of those questions. So I'm very proud tonight to introduce to you Mr. Aaron Moore, who began his entrepreneurial career in 2004 as he decided to start precision painting and decorating based in Bellwood, Illinois, only two years after graduating from EIU. His business has grown to employ over 40 people, and he has also been the recipient of the prestigious Inc. 5000 and Inc. Higher Power Awards. More recently, in 2014, he founded another venture, PPD Interiors, a construction company specializing in commercial interiors. Aaron also sits on numerous industry boards as part of the Value Space Small Giants community and volunteers with the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which helps inner city students develop and present business plans. He's passionate about entrepreneurship, culture, and values-driven leadership. So with that, let's give Aaron a warm welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marco. I appreciate it. And um, I will have my phone with me some because it works as my control. All right. So um, I'll, I guess I'll start. So Marco asked me, hey, uh, Aaron, can you come down and do this? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. Actually, uh, uh, the week last week, I gave us talk on values driven leadership to a group of painters. And I said, I was kind of hoping I could recycle it, quite frankly. <laughs> then he goes, well, actually, we were hoping that you could talk about you know, your journey through entrepreneurship. So I asked him, well, how long? He said, well, a half hour talk and a half hour questions. And I said, have you ever talked to an entrepreneur about talking about himself? I mean, a half an hour, give me a break. Uh, so uh, I'll try to keep it as short as I can. Uh, I guess that'll kind of lead me into how I wound up oh, right out of the gate at Easter. So, um, all right, we're on. 
All right, so I came uh, summer 1997. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where I want to go to school after taking a year off out of high school. I thought I wanted to be a professional baseball umpire. So I know what it's like to have ideas and then try it and then fall flat on your face. I've done it a lot. So I went to, uh, I, want, I wanted to go to Penn State University and I applied to Penn State and I applied to Eastern Illinois because I had a friend who I thought was going to go to Eastern Illinois. And I got accepted to both colleges and my parents said, well, after your display of judgment, we're going to let you pay for the first semester. So I came to Eastern. <laughs> if you know what out-of-state tuition is like, uh, it's crazy. So uh, that was how I wound up here. I came here knowing no one. So I literally moved into Carmen Hall. And uh, I don't even, is Carmen, Carmen's not have residence right now, right? Yeah, so I moved into Carmen Hall uh, in uh, the fall of 1997, knowing no one. So uh, I kind of have, was forced to get involved right away. I walked on the Eastern diving team. I uh, did that for a couple years. Uh, I joined the Delta Chi fraternity, which is uh, kind of a passing, but they're kind of coming back at this point. Uh, I signed up for Eastern's mock trial team. I joined the Interfraternal Council, and basically I just started getting involved. And uh, that, so I have kind of a funny story that leads me to what I think is probably the most profound thing that I found at Eastern. I came to Eastern in love, okay? So I mean, I had, I mean, I had this girl and I was in love. And we got here that Saturday or Sunday that my parents dropped me off and the next weekend she came down to visit. Now she liked me, I was cool at home and she wanted to go do something. So I'm like wandering the streets of Charleston, trying to find some party. I don't know anyone or anything. So I bring her back and she's like, you don't know anyone. I'm like, I got here a week ago. I don't know anybody. So she dumped me, <laughs> long story short. So moved three years later, she comes back to visit. Um, to vi she came back to visit me and I'm judging the Miss EIU pageant, right? So I had made a lot of friends. I had made a lot of connections. And that leads me to what I think is the fundamental piece of what happened to me at Eastern Illinois, is that Eastern is such a great place at teaching you to navigate social hierarchy and teaching you to make friends and teaching you to connect with people. And so that is kind of the, the, the first rule that I wanted to share is it's all about people. Uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship and when it comes to growing a business, it has to come down to people. And uh, it's about making friends, finding commonality, but more than that, it's about having the ability to see things from the perspective of others. And if I can encourage you to do something and, and to make you more successful in your life and in business, is when you're able to see things from the perspective of other people, you can understand why they would do things and why they, would, why they may buy something from you, why they may want you to service something that they have. So um, that was one of the things that Eastern taught me that I will be forever indebted to uh, Eastern. Uh, I wanna go right into the second rule that I think is when it comes to people, customer service is a non-negotiable. So when we talk about customer service, I've had some uh, interesting uh, times throughout the, the last year or so. And one of the things focuses in our organization is about making sure that everyone has that customer service. And when I talk about customers, I wanted to kind of talk about it's not what we think of just customers, right? So the easy customer is companies or individuals that you provide a product or service to. But when you're the leader of an organization or you're a general manager or even just a salesperson, we also have our employees, right? So those are customers. And so when, a customer, when an employee comes to me and says, hey, I would like to have a raise. So I need to have good customer service to that employee and I need to address their concern, let them know that they've been hurt and give them timely feedback. So that's something that's important. Vendors. So one of the strongest thing uh, that we do as an organization is we're very tight with vendors. National vendors, Sherwin Williams, Benjamin Moore is a painting company, and other vendors in other industries. Uh, the vendors are invaluable to you. They can send you a lot of work. They make your life easy by maybe delivering product, expediting shipping, ex expediting manufacturing. So uh, vendors are a huge key for that. Regulators. So this is something that you know a lot of people don't like to talk about, but at the end of the day, we answer to higher power as an organization, and businesses answer to higher power. So if, whether it's OSHA is at your job site making sure that you're following safety, or whether it's the tax man making sure you paid your taxes, 
having good service and making sure you always lead with a good foot forward will help you dramatically reduce the conflict in those situations. Competitors and colleagues last. So uh, I, I was actually talking to Marco before this and he said, hey, there may be somebody who may be a competitor of yours that comes. And uh, I said, I'm happy to share with everybody. I always lead all willing to share because at the end of the day, if all of my competitors were similar to me, then I actually have good competition. It's the people who don't run business like me that make my life very difficult. And the other piece of that is, no one can be me. So you have to be you, you have to do what's tr true to yourself. And so when you create stuff around your business, uh, it's important that you make it yours. So let me get on to um, how I wound up uh, starting a painting company. So. After college, I actually left after my junior year and did an internship for Charles Schwab. Uh, I was a finance, I graduated here in finance, and uh, I thought, you know, selling stocks, get my Series 7, did that. I did an internship and they offered me a full-time position and said they'd pay for me to go back to school. Well, it didn't work out. Uh, I am, I was immature, I was entrepreneurial, and I just did not quite buy into the large corporate culture that I needed to buy into, and uh, I made some mistakes, and it, and it didn't work out. So I came back to Eastern and finished up my degree. After that, I went back uh, and did a variety of sales jobs like any good sales <laughs> entrepreneur does just to try to make a living. I sold yellow pages, I did mortgages, whatever I could get my hands on. And on the weekends, I would help a buddy painting. So I ended up painting uh, whatever, I, whatever he had, and I would just tie in with him, and we would work. And I decided I was gonna to move to Seattle. So I got a job offer from Washington Mutual, was gonna to move to Seattle, and uh, my friend Sean came to me and said, I'll give you half the company if you'll stay. <laughs> so uh, I couldn't leave. So I ended up staying, and uh, so my career began at, in painting, and, we, uh, it, and it's been very good for me. Um, let me uh, show you a little bit about or, oh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, this guy that I met. So we, we closed our first big job, and uh, it's a new construction home for a guy in Chicago. And he was, a, uh, he was in sheet metal production. He produc produced box, electrical boxes. And uh, I was always fascinated. I mean, he'd show up in a Ferrari. He's building this mansion. And I mean, we're just, I was probably 24 or 25 years old. And I'd always ask him a lot of questions. So... I always recommend when you get in front of an entrepreneur, just ask them lots of questions if you want to become an entrepreneur, because they'll share, and if you ask them about themselves, they'll talk. Uh, so I would always ask them lots of questions. So one day, he shows up at lunch, and he goes, Aaron, I want to take you, I want to take you out for a ride. Is that me banging on this? Uh, I want to take you for a ride. And I jump in, and I go for a ride, and he goes, I want to teach you something. He has this Italian accent. His name was Andy Fabila. And he goes, Aaron, I teach you one thing. The long way is the short way. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about, Andy? And he's like, the long way is the short way. Just think about it. And that's all he would ever say to me. And every time he'd see me, he would just remind me that the long way was the short way. So I kind of took that, and I changed it to what I say is do the right damn thing. Uh, if you do the right thing, it's not always the easy decision. And, and that's what leads me into cultural discussion that I'll get into a little bit later. But uh, that's kind of the way that we've always run our business. And from that day forward, I kind of, it was somebody that I always looked up to that had a ridiculously successful business. And that's what he taught me. So uh, about precision. So this is my company now. We're in the Chicago area. We do residential and commercial painting contracting. Uh, you can see about 70% of our revenue comes from commercial painting. We use an all employee model, which means we don't subcontract our work, which is a very different model from all of the national franchise and a lot of people in the industry. What it does is it keeps the people on your team and it allows you to provide a great culture. Uh, we have 25 to 40 full-time painters, six-person office staff. Our three-year growth rate is 272%, and this year we made Inc. 5,000, uh, 1,564 on that list. So uh, we're proud of that. And here's a little picture of me uh, receiving the Inc. 5,000 award. That is the editor of Inc. So um, I'm going to be quiet for a second, and I'm going to show you a little video kind of about what we're doing now. We understand that it's difficult for people 
to have work done on their home. You come in, you invade their space, you move around things that haven't been moved in years. One of the things that we try to do is let them know that everything's gonna be okay. And from the moment that we step on site, you know you're working with an expert, you know you're working with a professional. A lot of companies start with businessmen, investors. This is a company that was built by a painter. So when you work with a company like this, everybody that you come in contact with is gonna give you the knowledge and the professionalism and the experience that you need to handle any job you have. When you initially call to schedule your very first appointment or have some questions or some interactions of any kind, it's gonna be with a live person every time during business hours. We do spend that time and money on education and development of employees rather than a model of subcontracting. The Precision Way is first and foremost a mindset. We're gonna be excellent on all the things that you would expect. So that would include showing up on time, that would include respecting your property. We wanna provide minimal disruption to our customers, whether they're commercial or residential. We focus on everything from interiors and exteriors, of homes to businesses to high-rise buildings top to bottom, big restaurant clients. Uh, we have national chains. Anything that needs painting, uh, we paint it. My biggest priority will be to make the customer happy, to make them feel comfortable with us working in their house so they don't have to worry about anything. They come home to a, a brand new paint job. We have the capabilities and the capacity to do all sorts of things in any type of environment, at any type of time frame. And when we get a chance to do that, it's very gratifying. Okay, so I have that uh, video I wanted to show you. So that's kind of what our company does. So that's, that's who we are, that's what we do, and uh, that's kind of the message that we want to convey. I want to show you one more video. We made a, uh, a video about uh, our employees and the employee engagement that kind of reaches out. And then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna go on to uh, a, the, the, the meat of the presentation here and kind of tell you some of the things that we think about business. In order for an organization to truly be successful, you have to have a winning philosophy where all people that touch the organization win, because if all stakeholders win, then you have a philosophy that can build long-term success. We have opportunity for growth. There's plenty of room for you to start as a painter and move up and expand. Um, and that's not just as a painter, you could move into the management side or sales in the field. The culture here is amazing and there's trust and there's respect. And those two things are important when you're an employee of a company and you wanna work hard. So I absolutely love what I do here. I love having the freedom to be successful. We have stable year-round work for our team members, which is not always the case in the construction industry. There was uh, other companies that I have worked for that we will work, you know, like crazy for two or three months and then you don't work for a month. In this company, ever since I started, I have worked through just about every winter. One experience I had was I got called into a job and whoever was there before, there's some less than standard craftsmanship going on there. She already had a low standard of who a painter is. By the end of that job, she was buying less lunch. Here was a lady who started with a terrible experience and knowing that I got to be part of a crew and part of a company that helped totally turn that around and radically improve her experience, that's a good feeling. All right, so I, um, I decided that uh, when I was preparing, and, and I had this, I didn't put this in the presentation, and then uh, I decided, I, you know, in the last couple weeks as an organization and as a leader, I've had to make some difficult decisions and uh, one of the things that I think as a, the, the strong leaders, uh, they're not afraid to show a little vulnerability. People like to do business with uh, people. So I wanna tell you guys a little story about um, what had kind of happened, and this is a story about my organization, and I think that you know, when I show you the videos, you see the people that are in the videos, and um, 
one of the people in that video is no longer with my company. And uh, it's one of the realities of entrepreneurship and business that you don't, they don't really teach you usually when you start a business, is that you're gonna be responsible for hiring people. You're gonna be responsible and uh, for people's well-being. You know, we as entrepreneurs, we as business owners, we employ a lot of people, and that includes a lot of their families that depend on what we do. And we make commitments to people, and we have to do our best to uphold them. And people make commitments to us in turn at the same, uh, at the same time. So and it's our responsibility to hold them to those commitments. Well, uh, we had someone that wasn't the right fit that had a lot of other personal issues going on uh, in their life. And things going on at home, things going on with family, things going on with finances. And, uh, you know, I had to make the decision that that person wasn't a good fit for our organization anymore. And, you know, what I would say is that one of the hardest parts of being an entrepreneur is that you have to be able to make that decision because that de decision affects so many other people in the organization. And while it's a hard seat to be in, it's something that if you truly want to be part of the entrepreneurial community, you need to have a hard talk with yourself about understanding that that's part of your job. So I wanted to share that with you. It's not something that I really love to talk about. <laughs> I like to talk about the rest of this, but I think like if I'm gonna impart some things on, uh, on you tonight, I think that's one that is an important reality and life lesson. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about how we got to where we are today. So, uh, or about the cultural vision or the, the cultural change that our organization has undergone and the importance that I believe culture and values driven leadership pay, plays in organizations. So uh, we, I started actively figuring out, you know, what happens is I was a painter, like she said in the video, I've done every job. So I started as a painter. When we rolled out QuickBooks, that was me. When we did our first payroll, that was me. You know, every single job along the way I have done. So. What happens is, you know, you have that mentality of a painter, then you have to have that mentality of an operations guy, then you have to learn that mentality of a sales guy. Well, about three years ago, once we had about 20 employees and I had a GM running operations, I said, I need to learn how to become a leader. You know, and that's the next step. And so I did a lot of uh, reading, watching videos, you know, attending conferences, trying to figure out what are the things that make leaders great. And uh, I kind of came up, I wanted to share with you some of the resources that I found uh, extremely valuable and show you some of the things that great companies tend to have in common. So um, you can, at the top, I'm gonna show you the name of the author and a book, and then I'll give you some of the presentation or tell you a little bit about it. But Simon Sinek does TED Talks. He also is an author and he also uh, moderates a lot of things. Uh, he does a TED Talk called How Great Leaders Inspire Action, and he talks about the golden circle. This is the model of the golden circle. So instead of people buying what you do, how you do, why you do, they buy, great leaders are able to establish why you do it, and then the rest come, right? So one great example that he gives in the video, and I'll be short with this, if, you, if you've seen it, great, if you haven't, is TiVo, right? So TiVo, and he explains this better than I probably will, but uh, think about how many of you TiVo things, right? Everybody TiVos it, but how many of you use a TiVo box? Oh, <laughs> two, okay. So we all DVR, we all record things, but what happened with TiVo and why TiVo was a massive commercial failure, essentially, they had the best technology, they were the first to the marketplace, which is the things that you need to be successful in business, but what did TiVo do? TiVo said, hey, we have this product that will allow you to record live TV, fast forward commercials, pause. So they told you what they did and how they did it. Now, if they said to you, if you're a person who likes total control of your life, we've got the product for you. There's a difference between how that's packaged. It records live TV, it does this, you know, then people buy and it inspires action. So what you're trying to do is inspire people. This is a great resource. This is kind of how we wound up uh, figuring out our purpose, which I'll get to in just a couple minutes. Uh, John Mackey is the CEO of, or CEO, president of Whole Foods. He wrote a book called Conscious Capitalism. He talks about the four tenets of capitalism. This is kind of what, of conscious capitalism. This is what he does. Um, having a higher purpose and core values is probably the one that speaks loudest to me. 
then we talk about sh stakeholder integration, right? Rather than the old model of the goal of a corporation is to increase, uh, increase shareholder wealth, I will argue that that is completely wrong. Uh, and it was, it's, it's what they teach in finance classes 20 years ago that they probably don't teach anymore. Uh, conscious leadership, conscious culture and management. So these are, these are, you know, you can go there and find out, but I just wanted to give you some resources to take away if some of this stuff speaks to you. Uh, small giants. So the factors that make small giants are leadership, community, relationship, culture, passion, and profit. So you want to have great leaders that are rooted in the community, that believe in people, and having relationships with people being very important. Uh, practices a culture of intimacy within the organization, people that talk, people that share, people that uh, don't avoid conflict, that just resolve conflict. Uh, and leaders that have a burning passion. And then obviously, we have to make money if we want to be in business tomorrow. So that's a, that's a big piece, because a lot of these businesses that we hear, or people will come and talk to me about a business idea that they have, and it'll solve world hunger. And then I go, well, how, how are you going to make money? So if you don't make money, your business is not a viable option. So we have to have profit, and it's not a bad word. So purpose and values are the brand promise and define excellence. Uh, that's something that we really hold true to be in our organization. We focus on purpose and values, and I wanted to just kind of share how we got to those. So we came out, we understood that there was something different about us. This long way is the short way approach made something different about our organization. So what we did is we brought everybody in. The one thing I will tell you about purpose and values is the president of the company cannot write the purpose and values and come in and smack everybody over the head and go, here's our purpose and values. It will not work. So in order to really come up with what they are, um, we had a third party person come in. We brought people from the field. We brought competitors. We brought vendors and said, what makes precision painting different? And this is kind of what we identified. So precision's purpose. Our team of service professionals is altering the perception of the contracting world by providing our clients with complete confidence and minimal disruption from beginning to end. So that's what we do differently. That's why our people show up to work every day, because we want to change an industry. If you think about the home services and commercial building industry, whenever you hire someone, it's almost like flipping a coin as to whether or not it's going to turn out good or bad. Our goal is to, from the minute someone calls in, they're led with that confidence and they know this company is going to do it right. So it was important to us, and then minimizing disruption is also obviously uh, something that we have in our industry that's very important. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pop through our values here, and then uh, I'll take some questions. So our, state, our value statements are collective I statements, so we start with we, but they're all statements that lead to us. Uh, not one value is more important than the other, and uh, one of the ways that we uh, discern, uh, we, we filter all of our problems or situations through our values, and then we come up with a solution. If the problem, if the value that they're filtering it through is not more than one, then it doesn't work, right? So like, you might have a value that says, have fun at work. So maybe fun at work is throwing things at each other. Well, the guy that you're picking on is not necessarily having fun. So that doesn't work, right? So we have to put it through two or more values all the time. All right, so our first value, we treat people, places, and projects with respect. We are honest and operate with integrity. We learn and grow daily so that we improve as people and as an organization. We deliver through persistence. We operate in a fiscally responsible manner in order to honor our commitments to all stakeholders. We celebrate successes and recognize uncommon performance. We take pride in meeting our own expectations and exceeding those of our clients. We encourage balance and value family, both yours and ours, and personal accountability. It starts with me. So those are our values. That's what we take forward. And it's something that we take a lot of pride in. And it's really it, it's fundamental in the growth and development of our organization. And I would say if you're looking at uh, starting a business or going into business, this is something that you need to take to your organization. Uh, so finally, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And Aristotle said that. So I challenge you to make excellence uh, a habit. 
and uh, thanks. And I, I'd be happy to answer a bunch of questions. Uh, I think I did that right in about 30 minutes, so I tried to tried to listen. Okay, maybe first question: Was there ever a point you didn't think that the painting business would actually succeed? <laughs> That, does that have to be past tense or no? It's always a it's always a question. It's something that you worry about. Um, there were times. So I've had a lot of challenges with, you know, one of the problems with entrepreneurs is we have like entrepreneurial seizures where we change our mind. So it's not whether the business would succeed. It's just like I have this new great idea and this thing's holding me back. But uh, I I have tried other things in the meantime. Uh, I always thought maybe if I got something to be more successful than the painting company, maybe I would let it go. But now where the painting company is, I don't think we'll be having those discussions anymore. Okay. Then we have a couple of questions here relating to the same kind of issue. Um, what have you learned from your failures? And relatedly, if you could go back and do one thing differently, what would it be? Okay. So I would stay away from retail. I opened a shoe store, <laughs> and that one didn't work out so well. Um, that is one thing. And you know, one of the other things um, that I learned is I'm not a big fan of partners. So if I'm going to own something, it's going to be 100% from here forward. Um, I think partnerships are very difficult, and I'm not against them. I think that sometimes there's reasons. But I would say this. One thing I've learned is someone has to be 100% in charge. Mm -hmm. If you want to lead an organization, someone has to be in charge. And uh, so if you're going to go into a partnership, you need to decide early on who's going to be in charge and make them have a larger stake in the game. Okay. Um, you talked about values. You talked about lessons learned along the way. Um, here's a question. What lessons did you learn at EIU? What, what did EIU provide for sure. you along the way? Sure, well, I, I kind of led with that. I think one of the great things that EIU provided me was that it's, it's a big enough school to have a lot of people to meet, but it's a small enough school that you can maintain intimacy and actually get to know a lot of people. And that part of the people piece, right? So that's kind of, you can call it sales, you can call it whatever you will, but that people piece of being able to meet people here and make friends throughout the university and, uh, start knowing no one and leave literally feeling like I knew every single person here uh, was really uh, fundamental in how I grew my business. And how we grow businesses is very similar to that, is that I am able to establish commonality, and even actually I establish commonality through Eastern Illinois University a lot. I'm able to ask a couple questions when I meet someone, and one of my goals is within five questions to identify how I know you. Because if you know me, you trust me. So that's one of the things that I always try to do, whether it's through geography, you know, you can start with geography, and uh, that's one of the things that Eastern has given me is a huge network of people, and it's really helped uh, increase our business. Okay. Um, when things don't go the way you want them to go, what keeps you motivated to keep going, not to give up? Well, I don't know if any of you looked at my LinkedIn profile. It says that I'm an entrepreneur and eternal optimist. So the, it's a good and a bad is that I really don't ever see the downside of things. So I get railroaded when I make bad decisions. But I, I honestly always think that as long as I'm backing it, I can make it successful. And so it's, that really, it's a real level of confidence. I think that I'm super confident in my abilities. And whatever I don't know, I will find out, and I don't, one of the things that I tell people is, I don't do anything sort of. You know, I don't do anything kind of. Either I do it, and that's all I'm focused on, or I'm not doing it. So uh, that's one of the things that I think would be, that is helpful in that area. Um, as you hire people for your company, you mentioned somebody left, so you have to replace them. Um, you have this long list of values that you, that you, that you instill in your employees. As you hire uh, new employees, what do you look for? What are skills or traits that you sure. want to, be, be, to, to hire? Right. So that's one of the best things. Um, so painting is intrinsically difficult employee-wise. Uh, you know, we, we're, what I discussed with you is a key employee. We have frontline employees with probably average 20 to 25% annual turnover. 
So, I mean, we have a revolving door of interviewing people coming in and going. It's just kind of the nature of what we do. Um, that figuring out what your values are and putting them down on paper is how you do that, right? So now we hire on values, not on skills, because you can develop skills. And if you find someone whose values, who has that value alignment, it will fall right into line when they meet everybody else in the organization and the skills will come quickly because they value themselves and they, one part of their value is to get better every day, right? So that's one of our values is to learn and get better every single day, personally and professionally. So when you find somebody, so our interviews actually like for a painter position, other than the first two minutes of like, where have you worked? Tell me a little bit about yourself. All other questions are really crafted to elicit what their values are. And then that will help with uh, finding the right fit. And then having the resources to train, because you have, obviously the training piece takes some resources. Okay. Um, question here in a little different direction. You're a company that's based in the Chicagoland area. Have you ever thought about expanding to other parts of the country? Yeah, we actually just opened our first office in Milwaukee. I've been traveling. We've been building a scalable model for quite some time. Uh, the challenge that we have is uh, employees, right? So it's really hard. Like I can plant a salesperson and get a bunch of painting work, but it's really hard to get painters, right? So, and because of our values, we don't believe in the paint brokerage business, which is sell a paint job to Mrs. Jones, sell a paint job to Bob the painter, and just take a little cut in the middle. We don't think that that's a good business model. Um, it's good for bottom line, but it's a tra it's operates on trade-offs. So we want a philosophy where everybody wins. So um, we have been looking at an acquisition-based growth model. So we've been interviewing companies. We've identified the companies that we want to uh, acquire, what their revenue targets look like, what they are. And what we believe is that um, one of the things in our industry is you have a lot of owner-operators. So we operate in about a $40 billion industry paint application, 37, IBIS, is somewhere in 37 to $40 billion range. Uh, and if you do a million dollars in revenue, you're in the top 10%. So that's a pretty highly fragmented market if you know any, if you understand what I'm saying. So we have all these small companies and no big companies. And even the big companies, like the national franchises, operate like thousand small companies. They have one guy who, you know, so what we think, or what we really know is that there's a lot of people that have all, they come out of painting and have almost what it takes, but there's something that's holding them back. And we think that if we can take those uh, weights off of their shoulders, we can, like, maybe it's administrative, maybe it's operational, maybe it's training, maybe it's sales, and we can cater to their talents, then we can allow them the freedom to be more successful, and we can do the heavy lifting because we have, like, a team of Clydesdales rather than, you know, one horse. Um, related to that, any other plans for the future? What is Where, where do you see precision go? Well, um, the painting company will remain the painting company. I think we're going to stay in residential and commercial painting. I don't see anything going into industrial. Uh, there are a lot of regulations and things that make that a very difficult business. And uh, we did start a construction company. So uh, I started a company, PPD Interiors. And that is a full service commercial construction company, which is kind of nice because that company feeds all of its painting work. It's like having an in-house paint shop. So we're able to do that. And depending on how that goes, we may look to self-perform other trades. Uh, so we may see growth in that. But um, primarily we're growing in the construction field and we think that that can help support the painting, uh, the painting business as well. What's your, just out of curiosity, what's your market share in either the Chicago area or I don't know how you benchmark yourself. For yeah, I mean, in Chicago, so it's very difficult. I mean, the market in Chicago, it's minuscule, right? So right. the market in Chicago is probably uh, a little over a billion in painting <laughs> services, and we represent about three and a half million. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're like a blip on the radar in painting, but a lot of that painting services is also industrial coatings and like big uh, we also have to look at the structure of union, non-union, open shop. There's a lot of politics involved with how we run our business, but um, our market share in painting is minuscule. We think that there's no reason why you couldn't do 100 million in Chicago. Okay. 
Um, when you got started, how did you finance your business initially? All right, so this is one of the things probably that I talk about most is growing your business um, and financing your business. So how did I finance it from the get-go? I was two guys and a paintbrush, so it didn't take a lot of money to get it off the ground. But uh, what happens is when you grow and you want to make the jump into obtaining large commercial contracts, there's a few ways that you can do it. So we're really strong in financial management, thanks to Eastern. Uh, I have, with the finance background, which not very many painters have, we've been, we actively manage uh, cash flow projections and we watch book values and snapshot our company every week and we keep rolling totals and we use lines and borrow and pay. But initially when we did it the first time, I saved my money and financed my first year, I doubled, I did it through retained earnings. So we always contributed 10% of revenue to retained earnings and so that we could finance it out of pocket. So I did it with retained earnings and a $50,000 credit card, <laughs> honestly. And now we have lines of credit and bank, you know, like that's the quickest way to get a bank to listen to you, right? Like double your business without asking them for money and be profitable, they'll listen. Uh, we have a couple of questions here about how you get the word out about your company. How do you, what kind of advertising do you do, word of mouth? Well, one of the benefits to having started in the early 2000s just out of college is that we were one of the early website adopters. So we get a lot of web traffic organically just because we were one of the first ones there. And uh, we've always maintained a site that we constantly updated every year or two. So that helps us bring in a lot of organic traffic. We, we do have some subscription-based stuff. In the commercial world, we use uh, commercial lead generating services that will get us in front of general contractors. But the primary thing, uh, we're, we're involved in a lot of organizations, uh, networking, not networking, but like uh, there, there's organizations for building managers, right? So we sponsor those organizations and we send people to their meetings and we meet people that we want to do business with. We usually grow our business very highly targeted. So we say, we want to work for this specific company because they're doing a ton of work in Chicago. And then we go get them, you know? And that's one of the ways that we really, we do it strategically and we go after them, whether it be through things like LinkedIn or just the old school walk through the door and introduce yourself. I mean, that gets us through a lot of tours. I mean, when I built the business, I built it stopping at new construction sites uh, and just walking in the door and asking if the builder was there. And I, and that's how we started was with new construction painting. And we do almost none of it at this point. Okay. Um, a couple of questions about your own planning. Mm -hmm. um, what's your own personal five-year plan? Oh. You know, the, so your I have the company. Yeah. So personally, um, is, is per personally, I have three children with the oldest being four. So that's my plan. <laughs> that's gonna take me, uh, that's gonna take up a little bit of time. And then uh, I'd like to get my handicap to a single digit. That's important to me. Um, and then as far as personally, like professionally, personally, I would like, uh, I really wanna continue to develop as a leader and be able to find ways to run these organizations well and continue to work on cultural buy-in and, uh, and work on having that real team environment and, and work as coaches, not bosses. You know, we really focus on uh, a leadership that we would call track and trust versus command and control. So instead of it being a top-down leadership, it's more of a team. Uh, so that's some of the things that are personally important to me. Related to that succession planning, you know, you're still young. Yeah. Haven't probably thought about this all right. along. Die. <laughs> Okay. I don't, I'm not, I mean, you know, I do hear, you know, I, I've been through a lot of se seminar succession planning, and it is important to some people, but I'm, I don't, I guess one day maybe I'll come back and go, I wish I would have done some succession planning, but on it, to be completely honest with you, uh, my, my plan is to work in forever, so. We, we, we had a speaker last night, and he mentioned during dinner conversation after the presentation that, uh, you know, his, his idea of succession planning was essentially to sell the business. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that he did not feel that he wanted to impose on his children 
the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the urgency of taking over the family business. Right. Um, any thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I do think about it. I think that, you know, likely, so what we're trying to do is build some assets. So, you know, the building that we're in, we buy, stuff like that. I would really like to eventually, so we, uh, we're an open book company. So we teach personal finance right out of the gate to our employees and then we share financial information transparently throughout the organization, which a lot of people would argue to teach a $15 an hour employee to show him that you made a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars last year is an issue, but I don't think that's necessarily an issue. As long as they understand that it's not all going in my pocket, you know, I mean, this is how we operate as a business. And so it get, what it really does is it breeds security. And so then the, the, uh, the next step in that would be to give the company back to the employees through the form of an ESOP. Mm -hmm. So that would be our long-term goal, would be to involve employees, because the more people that I can touch, and if, if all of the employees share in our successes, the more successful we'll be. So that would be a long-term <laughs> plan. But there's a lot more to turning your business over to Nisa than just saying, I'm gonna turn my business over to Nisa. So that's kind of, that would be, if I had a plan, that would be it. I'm just not there yet. Any advice for current EIU students? You were a student here. Yeah. What either did you pay a lot of attention to that you would want them to follow in your footsteps or are there things that you, you didn't do but you wish you would have done? Yeah. Well, one thing that I will say is uh, it, to be successful takes discipline, right? So get up and go to class. That would be my first recommendation, right? So like there's a lot of things that I made up for in being in presence, right? So by being present, I got a lot of information that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And I'm not saying that I was like, like it's Thursday night, right? So we are gonna be getting out of here soon. And uh, you know, everybody goes and have fun. My advice would be to come to class on Friday morning, you know? And that was really one of the things that I did very well that got me through. And, uh, and I was always able to um, just absorb a lot by sitting in the chair. So that's one of the things that I always tell kids when they're going to college students of my, or children of my employees, I'm like, just go to class. Okay. Um, what's your, maybe that's the last question for the night, unless we have any more questions. Do we have any more? We're good. Last question for the night. How do you define an entrepreneur? <laughs> well, that's a tough one. Uh, so I would, the, the one thing that, it's hard in the academic setting to tell you that entrepreneurs aren't trained, right? So entrepreneurs are born. And high-end entrepreneurs have a specific set of character and personality traits that you cannot get away from. And it doesn't matter, whatever I do, even if I went to work with somebody, I would be an entrepreneur. I would be a leader, I would take leadership roles, I would dive in, like I said, not kinda. You know, so um, that's one of the things about entrepreneurs that it, you, when you meet one, you usually know. And it's a, and, and it was funny because actually when uh, Mike Wilson introduced, you, introduced me to Marco, he said, he goes, by the way, Marco, he's always been like this. <laughs> that's how he introduced me. So uh, I think that it's a, it's a character, there's characteristics that are, have commonality, but a lot of it has to do with just passion and drive and ambition. So uh, you, know, you find some, like, I've always had that ambition and drive to do something entrepreneurial, and I think right now, it's like finding that thing that continually drives me, and now I, I know I've found what drives me is the ability to see how many people's lives I can influence. So when I have that, the more people I can employ, the more people that whose lives I can directly influence. So that's kind of where I'm at today. I could probably keep my company where it is, and I would live a pretty decent life and be happy, but really what you have to always have that driving force, and when you have that passion, it, the entrepreneur piece is easy. Very good. So with that, well, thank you very much for coming and talking to us.